I'm Warren Mayor Jim Fouts, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Fouts Forum. Today is devoted to Warren residents who have passed away in the last year from 2014 to January 2015. Today, we're going to honor Warren residents who are members of the Warren family who have made a difference, people who I've known and who have done things for the city of Warren, as well as honoring Warren businessmen who have been involved in Warren business for a long time and really have served the citizens of Warren well. My first guest today is Rick Kempa. Welcome to Faust Thank you, Warren, Mayor. Rick. And Rick is going to talk about uh, the owner of Downing Florist who passed away last year at a relatively young age of 76. He was uh, involved in the florist business for 50 years, 37 of which were in the city of Warren. Mm -hmm. And um, Rick, I'm going to start out by talking with you a little bit about um, the fact that your co-owner, Bob Bilek, uh, passed away last year, as we mm -hmm. know. But how did you? How did he come to come up with the name Downing's Florist? And where did it start? And what are some things that made Downing's Florist successful? Okay. Well, it started in Detroit, and the business was already in existence. They purchased, us from, purchased it from a man named uh, Clarence Downing, who, uh, as he aged, he decided he wanted to sell the business. And with $5,000 in his pocket and his business partner at the time had $5,000, they bought the business and started. And then they basically just uh, continued their business by uh, offering quality product, good service, uh, a friendly atmosphere, and uh, basically kept everything uh, running that way. They, they had good business practice. So that's how they kept their business continuing. And then when the Detroit area started to get a little tough and it was hard for us on, in Detroit to continue business because of the uh, people moving out, we moved to the suburbs like a lot of businesses have and that's where we started in Warren and continued the same practices. And I might add just to reinforce that, um, <clears throat> soon after I became mayor, I began to look for a florist that was close by that I could send flowers to Warren residents who had passed away or uh, things of that nature, and I found the Downing's florist, and I tried them a few times, and eventually I was won over by the fact that they gave excellent service, and I personally liked Bob Bilak, and I thought they were very cooperative, and we began to do work with them, and I have never regretted the work that I've done with them, either for myself personally, and I've done a lot of business personally with them, especially around Christmas time and when people that I know in Warren pass from a, a, an illness, but also the city has done some work with sure. you. And I think the bottom line is that Bob Bilek, as well as yourself, have been well-liked and well-respected by Warren residents. And that's frankly how I got involved in going to your Downing's uh, florist service, Flowers, because of the fact that many Warren residents recommended that. Let's talk a little bit more about Bob Bilek. Okay. I noticed you brought some um, things to show sure. us that would indicate a little bit about Bob Bilak, who really was, uh, he had some unusual traits that, that we should mention. He was a devoted dog lover. In his obituary, it mentioned he was closely devoted to his uh, friend Mickey, and I didn't know who <laughs> Mickey was, and you informed me that Mickey was a dog. What kind of a dog was Mickey? Mickey's still alive right. today. And tell us some things he did for dogs. Okay, well, Mickey uh, is a German schnauzer, and she was adopted from the Humane Society. She was an abused dog, so she, she came with issues. And um, she, he just, uh, he fell in love with her when um, I took him down there. He saw this dog that was shaved and, and shivering, and she became you know, his, his pet. That was it. We adopted her right away, and uh, two days later, she was in his house. And he was a type of person, especially when we were in Detroit on Gratiot, there would be a lot of stray dogs that would run across mm -hmm. the street and get injured. And, they had a dog named Gypsy that had been hit by a car and he took it and had surgery because it needed uh, its legs stitched up. And then there was another dog, Tinker, that one of the um, used car lots, they closed their business and left the dog, so he adopted the dog. So we were always picking up strays and taking care of animals and he'd go back there at night if they were in the store and make sure they were fed. And so he was an avid dog lover he, and they just kind of connected with him. How many dogs and animals do you think he rescued over the oh, years? Gosh. Um, I would say at least, that, that I know of in the time that I've been there, which is almost 40 years, I would say probably about 20. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and he also, I'm sure, devoted some money to an, animal oh, yeah. rescue, he, right? He uh, donated on a regular basis to the Michigan Humane Society, the Macomb Humane Society. 
uh, till, until actually just prior to his death, he still was donating yeah. to them. And I think that says something about an individual. I've always judged people by how they treat their children and how, in particular how they pre treat their pets. Sure. And people who care and love animals generally are pretty good people. Definitely. Yeah. Bob Bilak clearly was that kind of a person. Um, let's uh, look at, why don't you hold up each okay. one of these uh, well, plaques and sh tell us a little bit about this plaque. Well, this uh, was designer of the year, best to show. Uh, when they used to have the Detroit Home Builders Show at Cobo Center, uh, florists were asked to uh, submit arrangements for a competition and they would be judged by a group of your peers. And uh, there were many years he won uh, either an honorable mention, this one was best to show, or best in class. So he won several, several awards with his designs. He, he was a very good uh, floral designer, uh, very talented. He always stated that it had to do with his architectural background because mm -hmm. when he went to U of D, he studied architecture and he felt that that's what gave him the edge on, on creating floral arrangements. So, <laughs> And I can reinforce that because when I was looking for a florist, I had another long-term florist, but that florist had passed away. People said, this guy, Bob Bilek, <laughs> does an excellent job. Why don't you show us the artistic sure. painting that yeah, he did? He, he also um, painted. Um, he was a, I, oil apparently a and, pretty good artist. Yeah, right? he definitely was. This is one. This is the very la one of the last ones he was able to do as he, as his health deteriorated mm -hmm. and he aged. He couldn't uh, didn't have a steady hand. So, uh, he, but he loved to paint. Uh, he took classes, uh, and um, he he always thought about uh, joining the um, Warren Art Society. But mm -hmm. he just never felt he was capable of doing it because he couldn't he couldn't paint any longer. What kind of paintings did he generally do? Landscapes? He, mostly or? landscapes. Yeah. Uh, didn't, he didn't do, did not do any portraits. Mm -hmm. There were landscapes or seascapes, things of that nature. How many portraits do you think he's done over the years? Oh, wow. His, uh, he had in his house that his sister took probably like 20-some wow. uh, paintings there. We have you maybe have some four hanging up and down. Yeah, we have some in the store. Yeah. We have about four or five in the store mm -hmm. that we keep up. And, uh, well, so I think that's there? a real tribute. He was a great artist. He was a great animal lover. Yeah and his love and artistic efforts went toward servicing the citizens Correct. of Warrenville. Uh, last but not least, this show, yeah. that uh, photo was, of the Pope, Pope John. Yeah, he was quite thrilled when uh, we got John to... Paul, John Paul, John Paul, correct. Yeah. When we got to meet the Pope, because when the Pope came here to Hamtramck, uh, we were um, cleared, because you had to be cleared by the CIA, we were cleared to be part of the team mm -hmm. to decorate uh, oh. the different areas where the Pope was uh, with flowers. So uh, we decorated uh, around the uh, chair where he sat at, um, in the center by, um, in Hamtramck by Farmer Jack now. We decorated St. Florian Church. Mm. Uh, but that was quite a thrill to be able to work on that. And in fact, when we went and met the Pope, we told him that what we had done. And, and he basically, uh, he, loved, he said he loved Hamtramck, he loved the Michigan area. And he was just generally a nice man, the Pope. He was like you and I are talking. That's how we felt very comfortable. And I'm sure you and Bob must have been pretty excited about oh, meeting yeah. the Pope. Huh? <laughs> exactly. Did the Pope spend any time with you? He, did, he did, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was, because uh, we told him our heritage is Polish, mm -hmm. so he was mm -hmm. thrilled with that. And there was, um, not in this picture, but one of the pictures I had, uh, the gentleman that, um, like master of ceremonies that keeps mm -hmm. things going, the Pope was holding on to my hand and he wouldn't let go. And the other man's pulling me, stretching me, because, you know, they got to move things mm -hmm. along. And he finally had to tell the Pope, you know, let go so we can get things uh -huh. moving. But yeah, he was, he was quite, uh, quite the nice man, and it was quite a thrilling experience. Well, thank you. And right. I think uh, that sums up why I chose Bob Bilak and his co-partner Rick Kempa to speak today on Downing's Florist, uh, a, a great place for floral display. And obviously, Bob uh, exemplifies great artistic effort and great customer service. And and uh, a, a devotion to the church as well. Sure, definitely. So thank you, oh, Rick, thank you, for Mayor. coming today. Oh, and thank you for thank sharing you for with asking. us about Bob Bilek, who passed away last year. What was the date that a he died? April 1st, he died. April he died right 1st. in the store, as a matter of fact. Died in the store. Sitting so up, yeah. <laughs> died his last... Where he wanted to be, I guess. Yeah. Well, he's a great guy, and I wish you continued oh, success in another it, 30 years in Warren as oh, I, well. I hope so. Okay, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Today we're paying tribute to residents and citizens and business leaders who had a particular talent or passion for the city of Warren. And today's guest is Alma Cahill. She is the wife of Mike Cahill, who unfortunately passed away last year at the age of 84. Mike was um, a advocate of pro-life and he was a passionate writer. Uh, Mike had an interesting background. He graduated from Catholic Central High School he graduated from General Motors Tech. 
And he and Alma were married for approximately 60 years. And uh, whenever I ran into Mike, he was always a very sophisticated, tall and imposing figure. Mike, uh, to me, resembled the former Secretary of State under Truman, Dean Acheson. He had that a bit of a look. But uh, he wrote letters to the editor, to the news, the Free Press, the, and the Michigan Catholic. Um, he was devoted to his passion for life. And as a passionate advocate, he attended a lot of various events. And there was hardly a month, certainly not a year, that went by that he wasn't a, pad a passionate advocate for his position on life. Now, Alma, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you knew about uh, Mike as a long-term member of the family, 60 years to be exact. Yes, what I made mean, him the outstanding devoted person that he was? When he retired in 1988, he was, <clears throat> had worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield. And at that time, for some reason, he became obsessed with the uh, Right to Life movement. and. He had a philosophy because he felt that any person who had a problem could go to their family, could go to a friend, mm -hmm. could go to a church, uh, a city, state, even the federal government, and there would be somebody to help them if they asked for it. And Mike always felt the unborn had no choices. And so he and hundreds and hundreds of others as a group said, we're going to speak for those unborn children. And he devoted 23 years of his retirement life to that cause until he was unable to do it when he uh, became ill and had to um, you know, give it up. But really and truly, he wrote hundreds and hundreds of letters. He uh, worked eight days a week uh, in this forum. And yet, you know, to give him only tribute is, is uh, minor because there are hundreds and hundreds of people who work for the unborn and hardly any of them, any of them, get paid for their passion. Tell me a little bit about what Mike was like as a father and a husband. Truly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. He was a gentleman and he was a gentle man. He uh, kind of let other people run the show. And he was, you know, a director at, at a time at Blue Cross Blue Shield. What did he do for Blue Cross Blue Shield? Well, at first he started out just as a general accountant, mm -hmm. went on to become a supervisor, then a manager, and then a director. And he worked there for uh, 30 years. And um, he uh, was a kind gentleman. And the thing that I admired about him most was um, he was the first manager to hire an African-American woman mm. in a supervisor's job. And we're going back into the 60s. Mm -hmm. And then also there was a gay gentleman who uh, seemed to be floating out for someone to accept him in their department. And nobody seemed to want him. And Mike took him into his department and he became a good friend, not only to Mike, but to me. And so I think he had a passion uh, for all the life issues, not just for the unborn, but for the elderly. He took care of his mother and his uncle and his aunt, and he just was a wonderful, wonderful person. Well, thank you. And I would tell you that I appreciate the interview with you on Mike Cahill. I got to know Mike Cahill through, through various events, and I always found him to be a very devoted person to his beliefs, a devoted husband, a devoted father, and a man, as you say, who could stand up for people of various backgrounds, various issues. He was always a man who 
basically to quote Robert Kennedy, he would see things the way they are and he'd ask why, and he'd say, see things the way they could be and ask why not. And so I thank you for coming in today to talk about your husband, Mike Cahill, American, a man who cared passionately for others. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor. Welcome to another edition of Fouts Forum. Today we're paying tribute to uh, members of the Warren family, particularly members of the Warren business community, as well as Warren citizens who made a difference in the devotion and, and role that they played in the city of Warren. Today I'm honored to have as a guest uh, David Tembrowski, the son of Don Tembrowski, who died unfortunately last year at age 79. And the Tembrowski family, as all of you would know, is well known, obviously, for the Tembrowski funeral home, but also for some other things that they did throughout the years. So, David, I'd like you to begin by uh, telling us a little bit about the Tembrowski family. And briefly talking with David before we began recording, I found out that the Tembrowski family has been here a lot longer than even your dad, Donald Tembrowski. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the Tembrowskis, how they got involved in the city of Warren, and what they did in terms of contributions to the growth of the city. Sure, thank you for having me, Mr. Thank Mayor. Um, our family, uh, going back to my grandfather, actually, my grandfather was a pharmacist and, and my grandmother was a pharmacist down on the uh, east side of Detroit. And my grandfather comes from a family of uh, three brothers and one sister, and they were all professional people. And his one brother, Joe Tamrowski, was a developer. And Joe Tamrowski developed many of the homes in South Warren. And so there was always a connection to Warren. And then my dad became a uh, funeral director early on. He owned his own funeral home when he was in his 20s. And uh, he developed that on Van Dyke south of Six Mile. And uh, he eventually evolved as the community evolved in Warren. Uh, he followed the Polish Catholic uh, heritage of our family, and he uh, established our funeral home here in Warren in 1973. But we moved to Warren in 69. So we've been living in Warren since 1969. Uh, we all went through Warren Consolidated Schools, uh, six of our siblings, Tamrowskis. Uh, all Cusno High School grads, I assume. Cusno High School, mm -hmm. all the way through, uh, from elementary on up. So uh, yeah, long time in Warren, and uh, it's our home. Well, tell me this. I don't know if you can answer this question. It just came to my mind as you were talking. You said your dad became the owner of Tim Rowski Funeral Home at a very young age. You said, what, 25? Uh, he was probably 25 when he developed that one in, uh, across from his dad's drugstore in Detroit. Tell me, what uh, do you think motivated your dad to get into the funeral business? How was he able to be somewhat successful at such a young age? I mean, most people at 25 are still trying to find themselves. Your dad obviously had already found himself. Sure. He had. Uh, he started in pharmacology. He was going to be a pharmacist, follow his father's footsteps, and he found that that was not for him. Uh, he eventually found a job with uh, Jerome DeSantis Funeral Home in Detroit. And uh, from that point on, uh, mortuary science, uh, enlightened him. He, he enjoyed it. Uh, he enjoyed working with people and helping people. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what got him into it. And he eventually went on to work for uh, Ira Kaufman, the Jewish funeral oh, director over okay. in Southfield. Uh, very, very esteemed, well known. Very esteemed, yeah. yes. And, uh, and then he evolved from there. Tell me, what do you think allowed your father to be the success that he was when you realized that Tim Rowski Funeral Home is now over 40 years old? That... Um, You've been here since 1973, here it is 2015 now, and your father is well known. I've heard only good things about your dad. I, I think I briefly met him a couple of times, but everybody held him in high esteem. He was a particularly likable guy. Mm -hmm. um, I think modest, not a big ego, things like that. Maybe, maybe those are part of the secret, but I know that he was good friends with former Mayor Ted Bates. He also was close with Mayor Ron Bonkowski, and he seemed to know a lot of people, whether they be big people in the community or little pe people in the community, everybody liked your dad. What was the secret to your father's success, and what kind of a father was he? You're, one yeah. of, you're the fifth old, youngest son, youngest, fifth oldest yeah. son, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> 
or however you put it, but why don't you tell us a little bit about your dad? Well, his, it, my dad always said he had seven mouths to feed, and that's yeah. what motivated him. Yeah. Um, really, when he left Detroit and uh, the other funeral home, he was on his own, and he had a very young family. All of us, uh, he put us all through college, actually. Mm -hmm. He paid for it all. So uh, he was always working, and he was always motivated. But what motivated him more than anything, it really wasn't money. What motivated him was to be a success in the industry that he started in. He wanted to achieve a level of notoriety as a funeral director, uh, and he did that on his own. No one helped him, and uh, that really motivated him and kept him working very hard. He lived at the funeral home. Our house was 15 feet behind the funeral home. Mm. He answered the phones 24-7. My mom cleaned the funeral home. All of us cleaned and cut the lawn and plowed the snow. So it was a truly a family affair. Well, he was, just listening to you, he was a man who was driven to public service in one yes. sense of the word. He wasn't an elected official, but he's certainly driven there. Um, what, can you tell us some interesting stories about your dad? Besides being a funeral director, did he have other passions? Did he have other concerns? Did he have other things he probably put forward in the community? When we were, uh, when we were young children um, in the 70s, the early 70s, mm -hmm. the Oakland County uh, child abduction case was going on and my, my dad actually took it upon himself to produce and, and pay for a movie to be made, kind of a PSA, a public service uh, um, video, uh, to be put into the public schools mm -hmm. to educate young children of what to do and how to get away and how someone might try to abduct them. And it was controversial, controversial at the time. Parents didn't want uh, their kids even subjected to that. So uh, my dad convinced them, maybe with my mother, she, she was great at convincing the other mothers. And remember, Helping Hand was in our community and we used to have the hand in the windows of the houses. So that was something he did. But you're right, he was driven to public service. He would walk across the street to the fire station and eat dinner with the firemen. And, uh, and I might add that, you may want to talk about that. I've heard only high praise from police officers and firemen about the great work that Tim Rowski Funeral Home does. Can you explain how he got involved with Warren Police and Fire? Because I, I think he also uh, supported a, mem a memorial to fallen officers. You want to explain that a little bit? It, it started many years ago, and maybe I think uh, Father John Hall, who was at St. Martin de Porres, had a hand in that. But my dad used to buy these Polish cakes and bring them to the firemen, and he got to be real good friends with all the fire uh, leaders. Uh, Bill Karpinski was one good friend of my dad. Great guy, by yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so it, it evolved, and then as time went on, we be, uh, forged a close bond with the, uh, the police department. My dad's cousin was a, uh, a motor officer. Um, uh, Mike Schott was his name, and he's deceased now. But uh, maybe that was it. But again, back to public service and, and helping out. We always, um, uh, when there was a death of a fireman or a policeman or any civil servant, uh, we try to take care of those families from a financial and a service uh, standpoint. So uh, when Chris Wooters was killed in the line of duty, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we took that upon ourselves to try and reach out and help that family too. So uh, just giving back, that's what we're trying to do. And then with the monument that we uh, helped the city with, yes. it wasn't just us, it was the churches and you were involved in that. Uh, and we built that beautiful monument outside the police station for the fallen officers. That was extremely nice of you and something that will be a, a living memorial to the fallen police officers. And, and my dad. And, and to your dad as <laughs> well. Kind of you know, um, if I can just end this, I don't mean to end it on a sad point, but um, when did your dad decide to leave? Why did he decide to leave? And what were his final years like? Well, he didn't really leave the business. Yeah. He was always involved. He still, your mother and dad still own Tim Rowski. Oh, family. yeah. And when or your he, mother does now. Yeah. yeah. And when my dad was in town, he, he vacationed or, or lived in Florida. He was a snowbird. And when he was in town, he was at the funeral home every day. So he was still hands-on. And, and he would tell us that he's the boss. Yeah. And we should go out and read the sign whose yeah. name was on it because <laughs> he would remind us. So he was always involved. He never let go. And, and that was a good thing. Uh, and he always cared about the community. And he always... Uh, he always wanted to see the community do better. So. so the lasting tribute to your dad would be that he cared about others. 
He cared about his business and he always wanted to do the best he could and to provide the best service he could to the Warren community. Well, that's where he said, that's your bread and butter right there. All those people out there in that community are your bread and butter. So we haven't forgotten that. And I don't think people have forgotten you and Tim Browski Funeral Home for continuing to be the great place you are and a place that, that puts service and compassion and concern for others first. Thanks, Thank you Mr. for being here today. Uh, person today I'm going to talk about next is Marilyn Donlan. Marilyn Donlan yeah, was really part of a power couple in Warren going all the way back to the 1950s. She and her husband Bert um, single hand, maybe not single handedly, but they had a lot to do with the election of candidates at the presidential level, at the gubernatorial level, and at the city level. Marilyn Donlan and her husband Bert in about 1957 or 58 uh, threw a fundraiser for John Kennedy, who was then Senator John Kennedy. They both got to know Kennedy and helped him to get elected President of the United States. And Marilyn was a passionate believer that it was time to elect a Catholic president, and she and her husband Bert who was a good Irishman and knew the Kennedys quite well, did everything they could to help John Kennedy be elected the first Catholic president in 1960. Uh, Bert and Marilyn were also instrumental in getting involved and helping G. Men and Williams get elected governor throughout the 1950s through the 60s. And she was also very close with Jerry Cavanaugh. And she and her husband were part of former Detroit Mayor Kavanaugh's cabinet, and they helped uh, Mayor Kavanaugh in some of his successful endeavors. And later on, she helped uh, Mayor Kavanaugh's son get elected, I believe, to the Court of Appeals. So whether it be at the presidential or the gubernatorial or state level, she's been involved in helping a lot of people get elected. She also helped the Levins, uh, first uh, uh, the Sander Levin and then his brother Carl get elected to the U.S. Senate and Congress. Uh, she's also helped various uh, Warren elected officials get elected. Um, she's held various positions in Warren elected officials' uh, uh, offices. But I want to talk a little bit about some personal background about Marilyn Donlan. Um, uh, she came from uh, a Polish family. She was devoted to her family, and she was proud of her Polish heritage. Uh, she graduated from Cass Tech High School, and at the time, she was part of the Cass Tech Marching Band, I believe. She also played the piano, uh, she played the sax, and she played a couple of other organs as well. Very musically talented. And anybody who remembers Cass Tech, it was an honor high school. You had to be very smart to get into Cass Tech High School. From Cass Tech, uh, she went on and uh, got a degree from the University of Detroit. I believe at the time she went to college with Bill Bonds, who also passed away last year, and she was in the U of D marching band. So Marilyn had a lot of talents. When she was a young college student, she went to the Democratic Convention, I believe it was in um, Chicago, I'm not sure, and there she got a personal interview with Harry Truman. And Marilyn was always proud of the fact that President Truman invited her up to his bedroom to meet with her, and she had an exclusive interview with President Truman. Later on, of course, through her husband, Bert, she was able to get to know John Kennedy, and then she got to know G. Menon Williams, Governor, and the Levins, and a whole host of other people. Um, while involved in politics in the city of Warren, uh, Marilyn did a lot of things. Number one, I can't forget the education community. She became president of the Fitzgerald Teachers Federation, and she did an outstanding job as a teacher and leader of the Fitzgerald Federation. And many people said that she single-handedly helped to boost the pay and the rights of teachers. She also was the first woman to hold that position. She became the first woman to be chairwoman of the Warren Centerline uh, Dems. And uh, I think she made major inroads in, in a lot of things that she did related to being a woman. She was also the chairman of the first Warren Cable Commission. Uh, I think the Warren Cable operation today, as I have been told, is the top-notch cable operation in the state of Michigan, and Maryland had a lot to do with that as well. 
Uh, she helped Ron Bonkowski get elected mayor of Warren, and she became Ron Bonkowski's executive administrator for a period of time. She was the number two person in Warren. And then later on, she helped his opponent, Mark Steenberg, get elected, and she became the deputy mayor for Mark Steenberg for several years. Um, she also has been involved with other elected officials, and she's helped various other people get elected. And whether, again, it be president or whether it be um, governor or whether it be mayor, Marilyn has made a difference. And I think the one thing about Mayor uh, Marilyn is that she had a passion for the right thing, whether it be women's rights, whether it be civil rights, whether it be student rights, whether it be teacher rights. She made a difference in everything that she did. And sadly, she passed away uh, at the relatively young age of 79 last year. She devoted her life to the city of Warren and the Warren cable operation is a reflection of the outstanding job that she did in making the Warren Communications Department, the cable department, the best in the state. And clearly, whether it be John Kennedy, whether it be Mark Steenberg, whether it be Ron Bonkowski, or whether it be G. Men and Williams or the Levin brothers, she made a difference in making sure that a lot of people became devoted leaders to the taxpayers and the citizens of Warren because she cared and she made a difference. So I salute Marilyn Donlan, really the leader of a pioneer for women's rights in Michigan and a pioneer for making a difference in the city of Warren. Thank you, Marilyn, for the great job that you've done and thank you for all that you've done for the city of Warren. Another individual that I'd like to honor as part of our Warren community is Hubert Leach. Hubert Leach um, passed away last May 15th at age 87. Um, I think the most important thing to remember about him is that he was part of the greatest generation. He was a World War II veteran who really sailed around the world, um, I think, for uh, 15 months, 90,000 miles around the world. He joined World War II at the young age of 17 in 1944. He was part of many major battles, and um, he did a lot for his country. Um, after the war, Hubert came back, and like a lot of members of the greatest generation, he went on to serve his country well. And among other things, once he retired, he helped to maintain the Warren Historical a gallery. He became um, a curator of the Historical Art Gallery. Um, he was a member of the Warren Historical Society, and he and his wife, Dorothy, did a lot to help maintain the historical displays at the community center. I met him some time ago, and um, I found him to be a really classy guy, a very humble guy, wasn't interested in bragging about all the great things he did for the city or what he did for his country, but like all members of that greatest generation, he spoke softly, was very humble, and was devoted to his family. He was devoted to his wife, Dorothy, and he was devoted to helping Warren in whatever way he could. And the result was that uh, he was recognized as an outstanding Warren uh, volunteer, and he was also interviewed by Brian Lowers of the Warren Weekly for the Library of Congress, where he has a very fascinating interview, some of which will be shown today. But I just want to state another member of the greatest generation passed away last year, and a devoted member of the Warren family. I salute Hubert Leach for all that he did as a member of the World War II generation, during the war and all that he did after. Thank you, Hubert, for your devotion to the city of Warren and to your unselfish devotion to maintaining the Warren Historical Museum. Thank you. I have rifle fire from some of the islands in the, as we pass them in the canal, in the channel. Small arms fire. Small arms fire, yeah. This would have been Japanese soldiers yeah, and sailors that recognized yeah, the ship. We're still on some of the islands that uh, hadn't been cleaned out yet, you know. Some of them were tree snipers, you know, to hide up in a tree and they could see a longer distance and you could shoot out at the ships, but we were far enough out that rarely ever got a 
the rifle fire out there. No real problems with aircraft or submarines or? No, we, we took on every evasive actions we could. Uh, we went through the battle training stations, battle stations training, you know, and uh, they sound, periodically they sound the alarm and you'd run to your battle station, but a lot of cases it was just training, preparation, you know, having to keep you aware. So after participating in the invasion of Lady, where yeah. did you go after that? Uh, there was a group of islands called the Windy Isles, it's W-O-E-N-D-I-I, M-I-O, Mile Windy. Uh, we spent a day there, picked up wounded soldiers, picked up some army nurses there. Next member of the Warren family that I'd like to briefly mention was Dave Romag. Dave Romag was uh, the Melby Junior High School principal for over 21 years. Uh, Dave was devoted to family. He was devoted to his students. He was really into computers way before it was uh, in to be into computers. He was a military historian. He was a decorated veteran of the Korean War. I had the honor of briefly working him for a year, and I found him to be a very straight shooter, a devoted principal, and a person who cared about students and cared about teachers equally, and was always affable and was always willing to do whatever he could for both his city and for his educational community. Dave Robeg passed away, unfortunately, last year at the age of 81, after 21 years as a Melby Junior High School principal and several other years in the education community. He will be missed for his devotion to education and his devotion to Warren Consolidated Schools and making that school district and that school the best that he could possibly make it. Thank you and I salute Dave Romeg, a veteran of the Korean War. Another individual that I would like to uh, give a little uh, admiration to is Duke Melcher. Duke Melcher was a uh, teacher at Warren High School from 1960 to uh, 1994. I had the honor of working with Duke Melcher in the 1980s when I also was a government and psychology teacher at uh, Warren High School. I, find du I found Duke to be a good teacher, a math teacher. He was a baseball coach at Warren High School, and he was a junior varsity coach, coach, and he was extremely well-liked. Everybody liked Duke Melcher. His real name, I think, was Oren Melcher, but he had a way, he had a characteristic smile, and he was always there to work with you. He never complained. He was an intelligent, quiet coach, and he was very sociable, and he was well-liked by everybody. Pete uh, Cole, who coached with him, actually, he was a, a opponent, said that uh, Duke was a good coach, he was friendly, uh, he did his homework, and he knew everything about the opposing team, but he also respected the opposing team. Um, he was just a very decent person, and anybody who knew him was glad that they had met him, and I thank him for his nearly 35 years as a dedicated coach and teacher. And I might add this about Duke Melcher, that even though he was diagnosed with a fatal disease, he continued to coach and he continued to serve the community. And of course, one of the ways he served the community is that he was on the Parks and Recreation Commission for over 30 years as well. So whether it be coaching, whether it be teaching, or 30 years with the Warren Parks and Recreation Commission, he served everything he did well. And I think people will always remember him for the great characteristic smile that he had and the affable ability he had to get along with anyone and everyone. Thank you, Duke, for your years of dedicated coaching and teaching. Next Warren uh, citizen I'd like to recognize was Daryl Neeport. Daryl Neeport worked for the Warren Goodfellows for uh, decades and he was involved in canned food drives. Actually, he was a devoted member of the Warren Goodfellows for 45 years and it was every year Daryl would be out 
collecting for the Goodfellas. He passed away, unfortunately, last year at the age of 76, but for 45 years he was de dedicated to Goodfellas drives, and you could always see Daryl pleading with people for canned foods so that he could help the needy. I thank Daryl for all of his years of devoting to helping people's lives a little be better and helping those in need. Thank you, Daryl Neeport, for your 45 years of service to the Warren Goodfellows. Another individual was Dolly Muneer. Dolly uh, was 77 years old. She was the older sister of Wendy Muneer, and she was a very well-liked sister who also devoted a lot of time to family and friends. Uh, we uh, offer our sincere sympathy to the family of Dolly Muneer. Our next um, was Stephen Dwayne Sticker, Slicker. He was only 58 years old. His mother, Dolly, was on the Historical Commission, and um, she, we offer our sympathy to her on the untimely death of her son, Stephen Dwayne Slicker. Another person, a uh, Warren resident for many years, was Darlene Maximuk. Darlene was the devoted mother of Vixie, Vicki Maximuk. She was a long-term resident. She really cared about the city of Warren, and her home and her garden was always a place to look at with awe. And she was just an example of a Warren resident who did everything she could to beautify the city and support our city. And we offer our sympathy to Vicki Maximuk, the daughter of Darlene Maximuk. Another Warren resident for many years was Ed Bignotti. Uh, he passed away at the end of December, December 29, 2014, at the age of 90. He was a member of the greatest generation. He was a member of World War II. Uh, he fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, he was very active in Warren elections. He was devoted to his wife, Anna, for 60 years. And I personally knew him, and I know that he cared about the city. He would come to council meetings, and he would speak out on various issues of concern. And he had a strong desire to speak out against things that he thought were wrong, and he had a strong desire to support those who he thought were doing a good job. And above all else, he was part of that greatest generation. He fought in some tough battles in World War II. And I offer my sympathy to his wife, Anna, and to his family. Thank you, Ed Bignotti, for being part of the greatest generation and being one of the greatest Warren citizens. Uh, another one person is not from Warren, but he is an area judge, and his name was Judge Joe Agnello. And he died last year at the age of 91. He was uh, a judge in Hazel Park for many years. As a matter of fact, he was elected judge for 30 years and uh, he was a charter member of the Hazel Park Commission. He was a member of the Society of Italian Americans, and he was recognized as one of the most outstanding judges in Oakland County, but he was also a neighboring judge and a good friend of Judge George Montgomery, who was a long-serving member of the Warren Court. But again, Judge Agnello was part of the greatest generation, and we salute him as another devoted member of the greatest generation who passed away last year at the age of 91. Also recently I want to pay tribute to some individuals who passed away in the first month of Jan January of this year. The first one that comes to my mind is Gage Garmo. This is a heart-wrenching story about a young man who was diagnosed with bone cancer at age 14. He fought a very great battle. He uh, had a lot of friends at Rochester High School. His mother, by the way, Tina, works for the treasurer's office. And he waged a strong battle, and from 14 to 17, he did everything he could to battle it. He never complained. He was always more concerned about his fellow students at the high school than he was about himself. And sadly, a few weeks ago, he lost the battle, and he died at age 17, just about a week before his 18th birthday. I admire Gage Garmo. I certainly admire his mother, and I think uh, he's a tribute to the fact that he never let anything stop him, and he graduated from the high school. He did a good job while he was in high school, and he made hundreds and hundreds of friends at his high school because of his valiant effort and because of the kind of quality person he was. Seventeen is too young, but 
He did a lot in a short period of time, and he left literally hundreds of students from Rochester High School who will remember him for the kind of person he was. In addition, at the, during that same week, uh, Francis Scripter passed away uh, at the opposite end of the age. Uh, Francis was 98 years old. Um, I believe he was 98. And Francis uh, was a long-term member of the Warren Consolidated Community. He was principal of Warren High School from, I believe, 1939 to 1942. Um, he was a coach. He also, I think, was an assistant superintendent of schools and from Centerline. And here was a man that was nearly 100 years old but never let age get in his way. Uh, Francis was actively investing. He was on the computer, the Internet, for six hours a day investing things. Uh, he knew stocks real well. And a close friend of his said that Francis would say he would never use the word when I die. He would say if I died. Until the very end, he was actively and engaged in life. It was just within the last year that he was convinced to move into a senior assisted living home. And unfortunately, he caught the flu. And the flu is ultimately what stopped him from, I think, moving toward 100. But he was a very upbeat. He was a highly intelligent man. And he was devoted to looking up things, to being actively engaged in stock the stocks and bonds and things of that nature. And I think anybody who knew him in Warren Khan would say that he was clearly someone to look up to in the educational community. So I salute Francis Scripter on, at age 98, just a couple of years away from 100. And who knows, had it not been for the flu, I'm sure he would be still actively engaged in pursuing life. And as he said, he never used the word when. He said, if I die. He lived life to the fullest, and he is something that we can be proud about for those who were part of the Warren Consolidated School community. Also passing away recently, uh, just as this is being tape recorded today, was Charles Lampton. And Charles Lampton was part of the Warren Consolidated School community. He was a Cosmo High School teacher for, I would say, I don't have the information here, but I would say probably a good 50 years. Uh, he started the Warren Cusno radio station, and I think he helped to make communications what it is today. When I got elected to the city council in the 80s, he would report for the radio station on the council, and he would interview various council people. He was also a driver ed teacher, and he was also an English teacher. Charles Lampinen was a devoted teacher who never let time interfere with him. Some days he would be at the school from 6 in the morning until midnight doing his radio show, doing his teaching, and doing driver ed in between. But I salute Charles Lampinen for the kind of devoted teacher. He was a most unforgettable character, and he was a little bit of a character at time. But everybody who knew Charlie liked him, and he was affectionately known as Charlie Lampinen. And I salute Charlie Lampinen, who was again part of that greatest generation. He passed away this week at age 92. I'd also like to mention some notable uh, passing of people that weren't from Warren, but they, in one case, they were from Michigan, and they're people that I think we want to pay a little uh, attention to. First and foremost, the person who I think had the biggest impact upon local public communications television was Bill Bonds. I got to know Bill Bonds many years ago when I decided to run for state representative and I really had little chance of running and Bill Bonds thought that what I did was worth reporting and he made a nice little editorial that I always remember on a candidate who's on the give instead of the take and I appreciate that. I didn't win but I remember that Bill Bonds cared and I think when you remember Bill Bonds and some people remember that Bill maybe could imbibe a little bit when he was on the air, and maybe he was a little controversial. But Bill Bonds always tried to get a story right. Bill Bonds was always the epitome of perfection, and Bill Bonds always wanted to stand up for the underdog, whether it be because of race or whatever issues. Bill Bonds was a stand-up guy, and he was a top-notch newscaster. Some people say that in the day and age when people 
read the news. Bonds made the news, and Bonds was never a reader. He was a thinker, and I think Bonds made a big difference, and I think anybody who watched television in the 70s and 80s and 90s will never forget Bill Bonds and some of the things that he did, including one time he challenged Coleman Young to a boxing match. Other times he would be part of major news stories, but Bill Bonds made the news what it is. At one time, he was the highest paid newscaster, and everybody watched Bill Bonds because you never knew what he might say or what he might not say, but Bill Bonds made a difference, and I salute Bill Bonds as being probably the most outstanding newscaster in the last 30 or 40 years on television. Also, I wouldn't go without notice mentioning William Clay Ford. Uh, William Clay Ford died at the age of 88. He was a World War II veteran, the owner of the Lions, and the last of the original Ford children, all grandchildren, I should say, of Henry Ford I. In addition, I have to mention one great entertainer, and that is Joan Rivers. Part of the reason I mentioned Joan Rivers is, number one, because of her untimely death, but also because she appeared regularly at Andy Amos, and Joan could make you laugh like no other person could laugh. I can't tell Joan's jokes on cable or television because some of them were a little bit off color, but she was known as the politically incorrect comedian, and what Joan said would make you laugh. I remember being at Andy Amos, and I was eating spaghetti, and I lost my spaghetti with some of the things that she said because she was absolutely the funniest person that I've ever heard. Not for the faint of heart, but if you wanted to have a real good guttural laugh, and if you wanted to have an uncontrolled laugh, you went to see Joan Rivers. I have to say that I met her after uh, the, the, her performance. She was a quiet, she was a shy lady, and she was really a sweet, adorable person, although she could be gruff on stage. But one thing for sure, she was a great entertainer, and she made you really laugh. Also, I wouldn't go without mentioning some of the greatest generation that passed away last year, Mickey Rooney, who entertained everybody during the war. Uh, Shirley Temple, who also did the same thing and later worked in the Reagan administration. James Garner, Maverick, who also was part of that greatest generation. Sid Caesar, who was one of the greatest comedians of all time on your show of shows and Casey Kasem, who wasn't part of the greatest generation, but he was a veteran of radio, and when Casey Kasem played the top records, that's what the top records were. These are just a few of the many people who passed away last year, but again, 2014 is a year remembered, worth remembering for the outstanding people in the city of Warren, the outstanding people in Michigan, and the outstanding people in the United States who passed away. And again, I salute all of those people, and particularly I thank the people in Warren for making a difference, whether they be part of the greatest generation or whether they just be part of the Warren family. Thank you. And with that in mind, I thank you for listening to another Fouts Forum, a tribute to Warren residents, a tribute to Warren, Warren residents and Michigan residents, and a little tribute to those national figures who we will never ever forget. Thank you and have a good day.